Well, I'll go ahead and begin. Other people will be popping on. So again, if you don't see yourself, that's okay. Um, my name is Caitlin. I'm with Shift at Mile High. We are located in Denver. So if you are in Denver, hi, neighbor. If you're not, hi from afar. Um, Shift is a nonprofit space and we do donation-based weekly classes as well as we rent our space for large events for weddings and corporate things and things like that. Um, and those large events are what give us the ability to be able to have weekly based donation, I'm sorry, weekly donation based classes. So if you're in the Denver area, feel free to come on down for one to $30, you can get some mindfulness classes. We have yoga classes all week long and then great workshops are held at Shift as well, just like this one with Rosemary. Um, this is a poetry thought shop with Rosemary and she will take it from here, have a beautiful time and have fun tonight. Thanks, Caitlin. Thanks, Shift. Thanks to Beth and to Catherine also with Shift. And hi, friends. Welcome. Welcome to a play shop, a thought shop, as I like to say, a thought shop. Why? Because we're not going to do any actual writing tonight, although it may be good to have a pen in your hand because you can write down some ideas as we go. But mostly tonight is like the other thought shops me just giving you lots of ideas on a certain theme. So I'll read many poems, perhaps as many as 12 tonight, but we'll see how it goes. For each of the poems, I'll talk about it a little bit, and then I'll offer some prompt ideas for you to do your own writing, and I'll move on to the next. So you will be getting a recording, and it's maybe easier to work from the recording. When you get it, the recording will also come with a list of links to all of the poems and you can do it in your own home. So it's an experience now, just like a flush of inspiration. But when you get the recording, you can use it to listen along. And then when we get to the prompt, just put me on pause and do your own writing right there in your own home for as long as you want, no time limit. At least not, <laughs> at least not for me. And. Uh, and in that way, you can you can use this this thought shop as a way to launch into your own writing practice right there in your own home, or just enjoy it right now in the moment, and we'll see what happens. In the past, we have done some pretty serious themes. We've done dealing with a pandemic. We've done grief and grace. But tonight, friends, it's play, and I want to say that play is what brought me to poetry in the first place. Uh, it was when I was in fourth grade that I remember very clearly our writing assignment. And I remember thinking we had to write about a color and I thought, oh my gosh, that is so much fun. And I wrote the most, it was just a silly poem. It, was, it wasn't any good. There was nothing. <laughs> no one could ever think, oh my gosh, she's, she's gonna be a poet when she grows up. Obviously I was just having a good time, but it is that. It is that good time that has kept me coming to a page day after day after day after year after year after decade after decade. It is that there is in every moment when we sit down to write the potential for play. And um, well, we'll just see what that looks like tonight, what play can look like. Play, of course, can be funny, but it can also have a very dark underbelly and well, we're just going to see all the things that happen. And I thought I'd start out with a very playful poem that one of my present contemporary uh, favorites is Daniel Ladinsky, who does versions of Hafez and Rumi and other mystics. And this is one of his, a version of Hafez. First, the fish has to say something ain't right about this camel ride. And I'm getting so damn thirsty. That's the whole poem, but it's obviously having a good time. First, the fish has to say something ain't right about this camel ride. And I'm feeling so damn thirsty. So as I was thinking about play and how do poems play and how do poems invite us to play, I came up with six different ways. I'm sure there are more, there's probably I don't even know why I come up with a number, but there, I'm sure there are many, many, but here are six. And uh, we'll start out with just playing with sound. One of my first examples of how 
poetry can be fun, just playing with sound, was when I was in high school and we ended up singing uh, a version of Hist Whist by E.E. E. Cummings. And I remember being blown away because this was a poem that didn't actually make very much sense, but it was so much fun. So here we go. This is Hist Whist by E.E. E. Cummings. Hist Whist. Little ghost things tiptoe, twinkle toe, little twitchy witches, and tingling goblins hob a nub, a hob a nub, and little hoppy happy toad and tweeds, tweeds. And little itchy mousies with scuttling eyes, rustle, 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 and run, hide, hide, hide. Whisk, whisk. Look out for the old woman with the word on her nose for what she'll do to you. Nobody knows, for she knows the devil. <gasps> the devil. The devil. Ah, oh, the great green dancing devil, 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 devil. Wee! <laughs> All right. Okay. So it's just a really goofy poem that's having an awful lot of fun playing around with sound, making up words, and just having a good time. Um, another example of this, of course, is Jabberwocky. I won't recite the whole thing, but uh, we all know from Lewis Carroll, "'Twas brillig in the slithy toes, did gyre and gimble in the wabe, all mimsy were the borgos and the momraths outgrabe." And the poem, of course, goes on, but he's... Lewis Carroll just having a great time. He actually tells a narrative, uh, making up all these different words for what's happening in this made up world. So idea one for play, just have a good time making up words and playing with sounds and see what happens. Be nonsensical, be goofy. Idea one, play with sound. Idea two is to create a list and list poems. I'm sure if you've been in any class with me before, we've talked so many times about list poems and uh, a list poem can be really fun to write depending on what kind of list you have. So I'm gonna offer two examples. And by the way, uh, the chat bar, even so we don't see people's faces on screen, the chat bar is certainly open. There's also a Q&A bar. And oh, and somebody even has a question. Oh, it's Karen saying hello. <laughs> so if you have questions throughout this presentation, or if you have ideas or comments, or just want to talk with your friends, um, go ahead and use that chat bar to, to communicate with me as, as we move forward through this presentation. And at the end, we will have time for some Q&A. So here we move into how to play using a list poem. Uh, one of my favorite examples, and by the way, Oh, it says chat was disabled. Is that true? What? Well, that shouldn't happen. I tell you what, since chat's disabled, which is a bummer, go ahead and put all your comments into the Q&A. Oh, now it's open. Thank you. Thanks, Caitlin. I think Caitlin's the one who fixed that. Thank you. So how to use a list poem to create play. Um, this is one of my first examples, actually, when I think I realized just how fun a list poem could be was when I heard this poem, Zimmer Imagines Heaven. It's a poem by Paul Zimmer, and it's just a poem in which he imagines what heaven could be like. Here it is, Zimmer Imagines Heaven. I sit with Joseph Conrad in Monet's garden. We are listening to Yeats chant his poems. A breeze stirs through Thomas Hardy's mustache. John Skelton has gone to the house for beer. Wanda Lindowski lightly fingers a clavichord along the spruce tree walk. Roberto Clemente and Thurman Munson whistle a baseball back and forth. Mozart chats with Ellington and the roses. Monet smokes and dabs his canvas in the sun. Bruegel and Turner set easels behind the wisteria. The band is warming up in the big studio. Bead, brute, bird, and surge on saxes. Kai, Bill Harris, Lawrence Brown, trombones, a little jazz, Clifford, fats on trumpets, Kluk plays drums, Mingus bass, Bud the piano. Later, Madame Schumann Heink will sing Schubert. The monks of Benedictine Abbey will chant. There will be more poems from Emily Dickinson, James Wright, John Clare, Walt Whitman. Shakespeare rehearses players for King Lear. 
At dusk, Alice Toklas brings out platters of sweetbreads a la Napolitaine, salad, livonier, and a tureen of gazpacho de Malaga. And after the meal, Brahms passes fine cigars. God comes then, radiant, with a bottle of cognac. She pours generously into the snifters. I tell her, I have begun to learn what heaven is about. She wants to hear. It is, I say, being thankful for eternity. Her smile is the best part of the day. It's such a fun poem and it's such a sweet, easy poem. It's a list. And as Paul Zimmer says in the recording that I have of him reading it, he says, it's just a list. I hope it's a good list. You could make your own list. And there it is, the invitation. You could make your own list. What is your version of heaven? So just put in your own name. He has Zimmer imagines heaven. It could be Tromer imagines he heaven. Gail Newman imagines heaven. Linda Cook McDonald imagines heaven. Im put yourself in the poem and you imagine your own version of heaven. Notice how very specific he was, by the way. Um, he's got all these people. Clearly, he cares a lot about literature and music. He puts in all his heroes, and they're all with him there in heaven. He gets very specific about people. He gets very specific about food and about drink. Um, and then he brings in God, makes God a woman, and has a very brief conversation about it. What is heaven with God? Um, so there it is, the invitation. Make a list of your heaven consider maybe you meet God. What is God like? And perhaps you have a conversation with God. Perhaps you tell us something about what heaven really is. There you go, friends. Um, another kind of list is one from Alberto Rios. I'll just read it. Taking your Olympic measure. Think of the records you have held. For one second, you were the world's youngest person. It was a long time ago, but still. At this moment, you are living in the farthest thousandth of a second in the history of time. You have beaten yesterday's record. Again, you were perhaps the only participant, but in the race to get from your bedroom to the bathroom, you won. You win so much all the time in all things. Your heart simply beats and beats and beats, it does not lose. Although perhaps one day, nevertheless, the lists of firsts for you is endless. Doing what you have not done before. Tasting sake and mole, smelling bergamot, hearing less well than you used to. Not all records are for the scrapbook, of course. Sometimes you are best at being worst. Some records are secret. You know which ones. Some records you're not even aware of. In general, however, at the end of a long day, you are, unlikely as it may seem, the record holder of note. Again, oh, so that was taking your Olympic measure by Alberto Rios. And again, uh, just a list, a list in this case of <laughs> possible Olympic records you could have, uh, and also lists of your firsts. He's having such a good time in this poem, but notice how some are so kind of silly and trivial. Um, you know, it, you won the race from the bedroom to the bathroom. Some of them much more serious, for instance, how you're going to lose someday the beat of your heart, um, or how some records are secret. Sometimes you're the worst instead of the best. So I love how he goes back and forth in this very playful way between us aspiring to be our very best selves and us showing up in some ways as our worst. I will also say at this point, by the way, that starting a list poem, very easy. Finishing a list poem, 
can be very hard. <laughs> so if you struggle with it, know you're in good company. It's actually not very easy to end a list poem most of the time. But here's an idea for getting started, is to write a list of the records you have held, perhaps real records or perhaps ones that you have utterly made up. Um, you could do the same thing with a list of firsts, first things that you've done. Uh, of course, uh, these could be imaginary or real. Uh, I also think that's, so that's idea one, do exactly like uh, Alberto Rios. Idea two is to come up with an imaginary Olympic event that you could compete in, that you have an actual chance of winning. It could be, you know, writing the fastest poem or um, washing dishes the fastest or <laughs> the competition in which you, you, um, you're the best at deciding which container is best for the leftovers you still have on the pot in the stove. Or uh, you just create your own Olympic event that you think you could win. Who else might compete in that event with you? And just write about that. Uh, or... This is the third idea from this poem. What if you put yourself in any Olympic event that you have absolutely no chance of winning and just see what would happen if you competed in that event? What would happen if, you know, if I was swimming against Michael Phelps? You know, what would happen if I was trying to compete in, in the slalom? Um, and just show up as yourself in an Olympic event and uh, see what happens. Who's going to cheer for you? All right, so there we go. That was the list. So far we've got playing around with sound, making lists, and now we're going into what I like to call going down the rabbit hole. And the first poem in this category is called Wonderlick. And it's a poem that allows us to do lots of research on a single subject and just get very, 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 very curious. In this case, most of the research I'm thinking is just looking into the self. However, I also think that the poet, Mark Wunderlich, did some actual research about his family and about history and mythology. So this example of going down the rabbit hole is called Wunderlich by Mark Wunderlich. The name means odd. The name means queer. It can denote an odd fish. It suggests a queer chap. Sometimes it means capricious. It can also mean peevish. It's a synonym, synonym for a singular. It is thought to be poetic. The Pied Piper of Hamelin was called Ein Wunderlicher Kaus. With his colorful clothing, come to pipe the rats away. He drowned them in the vaser, or so the stories go. When the mayor withheld payment, he took the children and drowned them with the rats. Or maybe they went into the mountains, or maybe they moved to Transylvania. It is a hundred years since our children left, says the crumbling book found in the church. That is what it means to be a wonderlick. The name means strange things happened to him. It means he can be disputatious. It means he sometimes wears peculiar garments to a party that as he aged, he seemed younger, less reliable, more in touch with what he would call his soul. You might not call it that yourself. It can mean quarrelsome. It can mean he prefers cats. It means he has a gnome tattooed near the hair underneath his arm. It means he loves Christmas like a simpleton. It means making sushi out of spam. The name means curious, as in he bought a haunted house, and since weaning, he's not touched a woman's breast. It means he loves the color orange. It means he studied Dutch. It means pancakes for supper once again this week, and that he prefers to knit his own socks. The name means electric organ maestro. The name means famous botanical illustrator. It means the drunken tenor ass over tea kettle down a set of Viennese stairs. It is true. There are few of us that we spread ourselves thin around the globe. Find us making wine in Hungary, herding cattle in Namibia, 
captaining a ship somewhere off the Chilean coast. My wonderlicks steamed up the long brown Mississippi in a boat that put them there and their peculiarities off in Wisconsin, where the name means a shady farm growing a crop of moss on a roof, an old man with a pistol in his pants, a child who didn't survive and occupies a pagan's ashtray grave, excuse me, and occupies a pagan's ashy grave atop a limestone bluff where the wind speaks his strange name or worse, voices recognition an attribution or a curse. That was Wonderlick by Mark Wonderlick. And obviously it's a poem that's just going into an etymology, going down the rabbit hole, as I'm saying, and in some ways making up, what does this word mean? But he makes it up using, I believe probably for the most part, real stories, real things about himself, that he's peevish, that he, uh, wears peculiar garments to a party, that he loves Christmas like a simpleton. It's a great way to write kind of a resume poem about yourself that highlights your idiosyncrasies and peculiarities. And um, I like though that this poem, again, we find ourselves moving toward a dark underbelly so that he's talking about himself and all this kind of quirkiness he talks a little bit about his, his relatives, but when we move, find the, his family in Wisconsin, we end with a child who didn't survive. And I just think it's, it's sweet. It's sweet to see how does a poem move, in this case, from kind of the hilarious and the goofy and into the, the heart warming, not heart warming, maybe the heart opening, the heart opening. What, what else does it mean? beyond the silliness. And he, it's like he goes into that darkness and tickles it just a little bit. So an idea for your own poem, and I've done this myself. It's a really good time. I got this idea from my friend Phyllis, uh, one of my poetry students and beloved friends who also did this, who <laughs> she wrote a poem about her name. Write a poem about your name, your last name, your first name, and go into all the things that it means. You could be very sincere about it and go in and see what does it really mean? What is the etymology of the words? But you could also totally go into um, just your own history, go down the rabbit hole of yourself and, and use the word maybe a bunch, tie in a fairy tale perhaps like Mark Wunderlich did with the, with the Pied Piper, make fun of yourself and your flaws. Um, I don't know. I think this particular poem, this particular rabbit hole is a really good time. Um, another rabbit hole kind of poem. This is, I, I adore this poem by Baron Wormser. It's called A Quiet Life. What a person desires in life is a properly boiled egg. This isn't as easy as it seems. There must be gas and a stove. The gas requires pipelines, mastodon drills, banks that dispense of the lozenge of capital. There must be a pot, the product of mines and furnaces and factories, of dim early mornings and night owl shifts, of women in kerchiefs and men with sweat-soaked hair. Then water, the stuff of clouds and skies and God knows what causes it to happen. There seems always too much or too little of it and more pipelines, meters, pumping stations, towers, tanks, and salt, a miracle of the first order, the ace in any argument for God. Only God could have imagined from nothingness the paying of salt. Political peace, too. It should be quiet when one eats an egg. No political hoodlums knocking down doors, no lieutenants who are ticked off at their scheming girlfriends and take it out on you, no dictators posing as tribunes. It should be quiet, so quiet. You can hear the chicken, a creature usually mocked as a type of fool, a cluck chained to the chore of her body. Listen, there she is, 
pecking at a bit of grain that came from nowhere. That was A Quiet Life by Baron Wormser. Oh my gosh, I love this poem. And, and I, I love that he started with this. What a person desires in life is, and then he fills it in with a properly boiled egg. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's really sweet that in from this properly boiled egg, he comes up with all kinds of commerce and the weather and a proof for God and political uh, peace and, um, and somehow brings it all back to being very quiet, being very still, still and quiet enough you can hear the chicken, which is where we began in the poem. Uh, which came first, the chicken or the egg? I guess this poem says it's the egg. But um, so when I think about going down this particular rabbit hole, my idea for you is something I've done myself. This was such a great time, is to just fill in that blank, what a person desires in life is. When I wrote my own poem, uh, I started it with what, what a woman really needs is. And... Um, it's, it's so much fun. Whatever that thing is that you say, and honestly, I believe it could be anything. Like, I really think you could look around your house and come up with anything in your house and then just follow the rabbit hole. Where did that thing come from? What does it take to create that thing? Who is involved in creating it? And what do you need to be able to use it in the way you most want to use it? This is a really great time. It's, it takes some research. I absolutely love researching poems and that can be one of the most fun things and it will almost always arrive at some kind of bizarre, sweet epiphany. Um, so there you go. So, so far we've done play around with sound, make a list, go down the rabbit hole and now we're going to go into alternate realities. Um, this one is from Charles Simic in which he finds himself in a traffic jam and let's see what Charles Simic does. In this heavy traffic by Charles Simic, what if I were to ditch my car and walk away without a glance back while drivers honk their horns as I stroll into the nearby woods, determined once and for all to swap this breed of raving lunatics for a more benign kind who dwell long haired and naked close to nature. I'll let the sun in the sky be my guide. As I roam the countryside, stopping to chat with a porcupine or butterfly, while subsisting on edible plants I find, glad to share my meal with a moose or find a bear licking my face as I wake from a nap, wondering, where am I? Stuck in the traffic, you damn fool. That was In This Heavy Traffic by Charles Simic. Uh, <laughs> this poem begins with two of the most magical words in all of imagination, what if, what if? And he takes us from this place he really doesn't wanna be, the traffic jam, and he puts himself somewhere else, idyllic, right? He puts himself in a world where people live totally in peace and harmony with nature and subsist just on what you find as you walk around. This is a really fun idea for a poem. Take any activity during the day that you would rather escape and just write about what you would be doing in your ideal world instead of this thing that you're actually doing. You can start it just like Charles Simic did with the words, what if? What if I stopped vacuuming and I, you know, walked out into the meadow and this would happen in the meadow? Oh gosh, you know, I did a poem like this one time, although it wasn't based on this poem, but it was like this in which I was making dinner. And while I was making dinner, I imagined I was really out in outer space floating around in my little, you know, space outfit. When you're done writing your poem, your what if I wasn't doing this thing I don't like doing, what if I was off doing this imaginary fantasy amazingness, you can choose whether you bring yourself back to reality or not. Simic comes back to reality, but you don't have to. Um, here's another alternate reality poem. 
I'm in love with the Morton Salt Girl. And if you've taken classes with me before, there's a chance that we've done this one together before because this is absolutely one of my favorite prompt poems of all time. This is by Richard Peabody. I'm in love with the Morton Salt Girl. I'm in love with the Morton Salt Girl. I want to pour salt in her hair and watch her dance. I want to walk with her through the salt rain and pretend that it is water. I want to get lost in the Washington Cathedral and follow her salt trail to freedom. I want to discover her salt lick in the forests of Virginia. I want to stand in line for hours to see her walk on in the middle of a movie only to have the film break and watch salt pour out and flood the aisles. I want to sit in an empty theater up to my eyeballs in salt and dream of her. When I go home, she will be waiting for me in her white dress and I will drink salt water and lose my bad dreams. I will seek the blindness of salt, salt down my wounds, hang like a side of ham over the curtain rod in the bathroom and let her pour salt directly on my body. When she is done, I will lick her salty lips with my tongue and walk her down the stairs into the rain, wishing that I could grow gills and bathe in her vast salt seas. I'm in love with the Morton Salt Girl by Richard Peabody. This is such a fun alternate reality to find yourself in. Fall in love with any mascot or character or um, what are they called? Like a promotional, you know, like Tony the Tiger or just let yourself fall in love with someone who's not, <laughs> not really a person and see what happens. I have done this so many times and um Here's, here's one I wrote many years ago called, well, I actually don't remember what it's called, but it goes like this. I have fallen in love with Dr. Seuss. I want to slather him in rhymes until his Horton hears my who's. I've heard delicious rumors of his seven hump wump. Did he say seven humps? Seven? Oh, be still my wump -a thump I want to find him in my car. I want to find him near and far. I want to find him in my house. I want to find him up my block. <laughs> Excuse me. I know what you're thinking. Oh, come on, Rosemary. Dr. Seuss, isn't he a bit too old for you? But if he just take a gander, I'll be his mother goose. And oh, the places will go good. Doctor, put your wocket in my pocket. And when we're through, I want to get lost in your solace loo. I'd even devour green eggs and ham for the chance to roll in a rhyme with you. Right? It's just so much fun. So much fun. I've had love affairs with Mr. Clean and, and find him in my kitchen cleaning everything up. And just you, this is a great opportunity to have a good time. Uh, okay, so we've done playing with sound, having a list that's a fun list, going down the rabbit hole, entering into alternate reality. And now we're going to go off into the world of parody. And this first example of parody is uh, from Ron Kirkey, and it is Cinderella's Diary, in which he takes a fictional character, and he leads us into what happily ever after looks like. <laughs> We're going to go straight to the dark underbelly. Cinderella's diary. I miss my stepmother. What a thing to say. But it's true. The prince is so boring. Four hours to dress, and then the cheering throngs. Again, the page who holds the door is cute enough to eat. Where is he once Mr. Charming kisses my forehead goodnight? Every morning I gaze out a casement window at the hunters, dark men with blood on their boots who joke and mount, their black trousers straining, rough beards, callous hands, selfish, abrupt. Oh, dear diary. I am lost in ever after. Those insufferable birds, someone in every room with a lute, the queen calling me to look at another painting of her son. This time, 
holding the transparent slipper I wish I had never seen. That was Cinderella's Diary by Ron Kirkey. And what a fun way to play, right? To take a story that we all know and we all know the ending and to either change the ending. What if Cinderella ran away before he came back and found her own life off with the pumpkin? <laughs> or what if you do like Ron does? What if you write a diary entry for what happened after Happily Ever After? A pretty quick invitation into uh, the underside of the world. So that's idea one for parody, just riffing off a classic. And here's another idea. This is a, a poem that I wrote in a workshop with Colorado poet Wendy Vidalak, one of my favorite humans on the planet. And she invited us to take, what are they called? You know, sayings, famous sayings, and to tweak them. And this is what I wrote. This is called relearning. When the going gets tough, it just started. A bite's always worse than a bark. It's darkest before it gets darker. Absence makes the heart speak softly and carry a life rope. Out of sight, in the prayers. Good things come to those who love. All that glitters is meant to be shared. Where there's a will, there's a way to be tested. Get a taste of your own disaster. The squeaky wheel is also a song. Loss is the art of being mastered. That was relearning by me, just playing around with cliches and with, why can't I think of the word? Uh, sayings, sayings. And um, there's another word though that I'm not coming up with. Oh, well. You guys know what I'm saying. So just take these popular sayings and twist them, tweak them and see what happens. I found particular pleasure in making it rhyme, but you don't have to do that. Okay, we're coming to the end. This is the very last one of my ideas about how to create play with poems. As I said before, there are likely thousands more ways, but um, this is just entering into the realm of make-believe. And this is the last poem I have for us tonight. And then we'll have some time for questions. Aphorisms, says John Mason. Yes, thank you very much. Aphorisms. <laughs> thank you, John. You saved the night. So this is just a pure make-believe poem, um, but it starts with a sort of serious premise, I suppose. Um, just because a poem is deadly serious doesn't mean there isn't a chance to play. And I feel like this poem is the perfect proof for it. This is Rebecca Elson's poem, Antidotes to Fear of Death. Sometimes as an antidote to fear of death, I eat the stars. Those nights, lying on my back, I suck them from the quenching dark till they are all, all inside of me, pepper hot and sharp. Sometimes instead, I stir myself into a universe still young, still warm as blood, no outer space, just space. The light of all the not yet stars drifting like a bright mist and all of us and everything already there, but unconstrained by form. And sometimes it's enough to lie down here on earth beside our long ancestral bones, to walk across the cobble fields of our discarded skulls, each like a treasure, like a chrysalis thinking, whatever left these husks flew off on bright wings. That was Antidotes to Fear of Death by Rebecca Elson, who actually died shortly after she wrote this poem. And I love this poem because 
because it does what I think is so possible. It allows us to play with the most serious, the most essential of, of questions. What do we do when we're terrified? What do we do about our greatest fears? So in this case, she, she offers us three solutions, right? One, she eats stars. And then she tells us what they taste like, called peppery and sharp. Um, two, she decides to stir herself into the young universe before anything is formed. But three, she takes us back to the real world. Sometimes it's enough to lie down here on earth beside our long ancestral bones. She meets the thing that scares her most. She lies down with the bones. So here's an idea for writing a poem that both scares the pants off of you and allows you to play is to take something that you're very afraid of. You could take hers, the fear of death, but it could be anything you're afraid of and create an antidote. Um, just use the world around you to create a medicine and you can make it up, obviously, just like you used to maybe when you were a kid and you'd sit there and, and make potions. Um, add things into your potion as an antidote to this thing that you're most afraid of. Let us know what it tastes like. What have you put into it? Maybe do more than one antidote. And then perhaps see what happens if you bring it back to the real world and notice what does the real world, not just the imagination world, but what does the real world also have to offer you in terms of an antidote to your greatest fear? All right, friends, that is what I have for us tonight in terms of poems and prompts. And at this point, we have a few minutes left just to ask questions. And if you do want to go ahead and put it into the Q&A bar, since I still think the chat bar is maybe not working. Um, and once again, everything that I've said tonight, you'll receive not only the recording, but also a, a sheet that has links to all of these poems so that you can look at them on your own time, watch the recording and hang out with it and put it on pause and do your own writing. Um, does anybody have any questions tonight? I'm kind of watching the Q&A box as we go. Mm -hmm. Oh, looks like something just showed up. A great big thank you, says Jenny. And an anonymous attendee says, how does discipline fit into play? Oh my God, I love that question. How does discipline fit into play? Okay, so first let's break down the word discipline, um, which is a word that means literally, literally to, to teach, right? To, a disciple is one who learns. And I feel like the more we play, the better we play, right? The more you sit down and practice, the more easy it is to sit down and practice. You've probably noticed this from anything that you do over and over. You know, the more you play baseball, the easier it is to play baseball. The more you play piano, the easier it is to play piano. The more you play poetry, the easier it is to play poems. And um, I can tell you that having a daily writing practice means that I, I feel fluent. I feel fluent when I sit down to play with words. And that is what it always is for me. You know, I think if, if you've been play shops with me before, that's even what I call them. I call it a play shop. Why? Because it's a lot more fun than a workshop. And also because um, it's always available. What is play really, but an opportunity to lean into curiosity, to explore what we don't know. And, uh, and I feel like the more we do it, the, the easier it gets. Thanks for that great question. Shelly Francis says, where do you like to discover poems and poets? Oh my goodness. There are some really great websites uh, for discovering poems and places that will deliver these poems directly to your inbox. I really love Ada Limon. Presently, it's Ada Limon who does the, um, the daily poetry site that I'm spacing the name of. Uh, if somebody knows, <laughs> write it into the chat bar. Please. The slowdown, thank you, Travis West. Um, the slowdown, so Ada Limon curates that. I love finding poems there. Uh, I also love uh, 
American Life and Poetry, which is presently curated by uh, Kwame Dawes and Garrison Keeler and Writer's Almanac. They don't have present ones anymore, but they link you to everything in the past. You can also just go into their records and find them. Janice Falls, if you look up Janice Falls, um, she has a fabulous poetry blog out of Canada. And of course, I love looking in books. And some of my favorite books are anthologies. I love all of the anthologies by James Cruz. I love The Poetry of Presence by Phyllis Coldye and Ruby Wilson. And um, if you go on my blog, on my website, wordwoman.com, I have on there somewhere a, a whole list of my favorite poets and favorite journals and favorite websites. And you can find that somewhere hiding there in my, in my website. Karen H says, do you have participants share what they write? Yes, not ever in this format. Uh, this, is the, this is the thought shop format where it's just me giving ideas, but I would say almost all of the play shops are, are shared where we share with each other. We do actual writing together and share, but these are kind of condensed formats. Mike says, thank you, that was fun. Thank you, Michael Healy. And Shelly says, thank you for the wonderful list. Friends, thank you so much. Thank you for showing up for an evening of play. I'd like to thank Shift and specifically Beth who put it all together and Caitlin who's helping me host tonight. Uh, thanks to every one of you who showed up. I am so grateful for you and I hope you do have fun noticing that you can really just play, play with the language. Thanks for, oh, next time, next time will be, and this will be the last time in this kind of session, uh, we're going to be doing Leaning Into Uncertainty, and that's going to be on August 17th, almost a month away. And then I'll be doing a live event in November in Denver with Shift, and we'll, I'm sure we'll be sending out information about that. Thanks so much, friends. Oh, there y'all are showing up in the chat bar now. Thanks so much. Thank you.